Welcome everybody to the A24 Board of Education meeting. Uh, do I have a motion to go back into public session? Alex first, Nora second. Thank you. Um, and tonight before uh, we begin with the agenda, I just want to take a moment um, to acknowledge the tremendous loss that this district has suffered um, almost two weeks ago now. Um, with a student of ours um, that very tragic and sad loss to, to all of us here. Um, at the same time, I also want to acknowledge the both racist and horrific deaths that occurred in Buffalo um, about a week ago and the senseless tragedy that occurred in Texas just this morning. Um, these are moments that we all hope just stop happening and are deeply affected by them and yet nothing seems to change. Uh, and it is my fervent hope that sooner rather than later our leaders can find a way for change to happen so that these are a thing of the past. And with that, um, I'm gonna ask for the approval of minutes from May 10th, do I have a motion? Monica first, Mariquita second, all in favor, and it is unanimous. Um, we have approval of the treasurer's report. Do we wanna take them individually or jointly? Okay, so I'll take them both uh, March and April. Um, do I have a motion? Alec, one, Milesh, two, all in favor? Oh, oh I yes. Just say, um, but I just want to thank Amy for her work on the um, treasurer's report. This is uh, a much cleaner version of the report that we can really understand everything that's going on in the district. So we appreciate all the time that she's taken to revamp this report and, and align it with uh, best practice. So thank you, Amy. <laughs> um, recognition of community. Uh, yes, we have uh, Mary Rose Joseph who's going to recognize some students. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it is with my great pleasure to share the following um, achievements by our science scholars at EHS. Last time we were here, I think Mr. Hoser mentioned, we had several students win awards at the WESF, Westchester Science and Engineering Fair. One of those students was Anisha Musti, a junior um, who won an opportunity or earned an opportunity to present at the International Science and Engineering Fair, which occurred about 10 days ago in Atlanta, Georgia. And she won a National Security Agency Research Award, third place in cybersecurity. We had several other students who have also earned the opportunity to present another international fair called the Genius Olympiad, which will be virtual this year, and the awards will be in June later on. The projects are Sydney Burak, the title is Assessment of Optimal Promoter in Treating Cardiac Disease, Ronik Malik, Comparing and Analyzing the Performances of Green versus Brown Stocks, Rajan Sandhu, using constraint-based modeling to examine metabolic information from single cell RNA sequencing data. Jana Shreshta, assessing biodiversity in the Mayanus River Gorge Preserve using camera traps 2009 to 2019. Gotham Sony, analysis of PHF6 dependent alternative splicing in hematopoietic stem cells. Uh, Nova Wang, correlation analysis of PRMT dependent transcription with single cell resolution. Vivian Wong for novel fungicides, Gatton and Parade 20 SC as alternatives to conven conventional fungicides in combating powdery mildew, Podosphyra leukotrichia in Iderid apples, Malus domestica. I'd like to congratulate all of our students on these accomplishments and their awards and to the scholar teacher, Ms. Dardis and the science department teachers for the dedicated work to supporting all the students. Thank you. Um, and now we move to acceptance of gifts, Victoria. Yes, I'd like to ask the board's approval of a donation from the Luftman family to Sealy Place School, uh, requested to be used at the principal's discretion, and also to the Edgemont PTSA, $375 
for the junior senior high school requested for the ICAP summer program. Is there a motion? Marty Quinta, second Doya, all in favor, unanimous. Um, and we move on to the superintendent's report. Great. Uh, I know we are excited to hear the curriculum highlights, but just a quick thank you to the community for voting uh, to support our budget. The budget did pass with a 76 percentage, uh, by 76% with 152 yes votes and 47 no votes. It was a very low turnout. And as I think about why that may be, I know in the past I had been sending out reminders at the last minute. We had been making some phone calls at the last minute, just reminding people to vote. And that did not happen as much uh, maybe as in the past. Also, you might remember in the past, we had student activities happening to get the vote out. So we weren't quite in that full on in-person um, mode yet, but I do thank uh, those people who came out. It was a very important vote and also welcome to Noreen Jabor, who's joining the board and Grace Lynn, uh, who will be joining the board and welcome back to Nalesh Jane, who will remain on the board. So uh, thank you to the community and we'll be certifying that vote this evening on tonight's agenda. And now I would like to turn it over to Dr. Michael Curtin to introduce our, the highlights, people on the ground. Thank you, Victoria. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's uh, good to see everyone this evening. Um, traditionally, this time of year, we have op the opportunity to kind of zero in a little bit more on curriculum and what's happening in the schools. And tonight will be the first of uh, three meetings where we'll be highlighting different parts of our program. Tonight, the focus is on our wonderful elementary schools. Uh, the following two meetings, we'll be looking at some of the um, work of our teachers um, and more importantly, our students at EHS. Um, the next meeting will be looking at some humanities work and then the final of those three will be focused on um, STEAM, robotics, um, and uh, some science activities. Um, so we're very proud of what's going on. This is a great opportunity to keep the board and the community informed about some of that work. Um, tonight, each of the elementary schools is going to present on a uh, on work or a project that uh, they've been working on this year and give you an opportunity to find out about um, what we're doing in support of our district goal. Um, I think both of these presentations and projects really kind of represent um, our hard work our teachers hard work, our kids hard work on um, meeting those goals. So without further ado, who's going first? I don't remember, is it Greenville? Greenville, come on up. <laughs> Alphabetical order, right? Um, hello, good evening. Um, during the five years or so prior to the onset of the pandemic, Greenville's teachers in conjunction with the technology department staff spent a lot of time determining how technology, both hardware and software, could be used to enhance instruction. Tremendous strides were made, particularly in ensuring that technology was used to augment and not replace effective non-technological strategies. As we entered the spring of 2020 and the pandemic began, we found ourselves forced to use technology in a much broader fashion, not as much as an enhancement tool alone, but as a fundamental means of delivering instruction. Technology use expanded and teachers, even those who were less comfortable with its use pre-pandemic, developed their skill set and had an opportunity to learn new programs and many new uses for supporting their instruction. One of our greatest takeaways has been the reinforcement of what we already knew, that instruction is most effective in person that there is no substitute for the personal connections that come from learning in the same space, and that technology, when used strategically, is a great addition to student learning, particularly in how it allows students to be more creative and to learn and share in ways that align with their strengths and interests. Good evening. As we emerge from the pandemic, we are reflecting on the specific programs and technology tools that have been the most effective in enhancing our students' instruction. 
Looking at the last few years through the lens of creative change, we can look at our use of technology as one of the areas where we have exponentially grown and changed. Technology is an important part of the day in kindergarten through sixth grade. It has improved our ability to assess students. It allows for greater collaboration between students. It gives students the opportunity to travel through the community, the country, and beyond, and inspires curious young minds to explore topics they may, may not otherwise if technology was unavailable. Tiffany McEwen and Hannah Ottman's presentation highlights technology use in a cross section of grade levels and content areas. They will discuss everyday use of technology and how it is used for special projects. Importantly, they will talk about how technology enhances their instruction and allows for student choice and collaboration, greater research opportunities, and varied feedback. Among the platforms they will discuss are Flipgrid, Jamboard, Padlet, and digital notebooks. It is my pleasure to turn it over to Tiffany McEwen, who is part of our fifth grade team, and Hannah Ottman, who is part of our sixth grade team. Good evening, everybody. <clears throat> so I'm going to be speaking a bit about our sixth grade social studies program here at Greenville and how we integrate technology through our end of unit projects. So um, in sixth grade social studies, um, we've done many exciting end of unit projects that involve technology. At the end of our Mesopotamia unit, students created podcasts describing inventions and achievements to come out of Mesopotamia and the lasting effects they have on our lives today. Um, and if you click on yeah, <laughs> the podcast examples and scroll down, um, you can look at the QR codes and those will lead you to the different podcasts that students created. We're going to be sharing these slides with everybody so you could sort of browse these at your leisure. <laughs> um, and then if you click on um, can you go back, please? If you click on the images, they will link the image um, of each different end of unit project. They will link to um, the directions and instructions about each project. So, <clears throat> um, so for Mesopotamia, the students created different podcasts. Um, for ancient China unit, the students created Shark Tank presentations. Uh, students decided on an invention from ancient China researched it and worked in groups to create Shark Tank presentations to convince a group of sharks to invest in their new invention. Um, if you click on the images underneath, you could see some student examples, that, uh, the ancient China Shark Tank examples. Yep, and if you go back and you just click on the link for the examples. Yeah, yep. And these are some images of students presenting their information and their inventions and trying to pitch to the sharks and convince the sharks to invest in their new product or invention. <clears throat> For our ancient Greece unit, which we are just finishing up right now, students created Greek god and goddess websites. Um, students worked in groups, researched and created websites about a Greek god or goddess of their choice. Um, and if again, if you click on, and can you just go to the first one, please? And this is just an example of a student's website where they um, added web pages about homepage, family history, interesting facts, and real world connections um, to really teach everybody about their Greek god or goddess in more detail. And last but not least, our Egypt Fair presentation, which I'm going to be speaking in a little bit more detail about tonight. So, um, okay. Um, can, you, can we go back and then just show the next slide? <laughs> Thank you. Next slide, please. Thanks. So, Egypt, the Egypt Fair has always been um, a fun and interactive way for students to present their topics to the school and parents. Students have typically researched topics of their choice. Um, taken notes on their topics, written essays, and created posters to present their information. Students dressed up as someone related to their topic and had an interactive experience with the school and parents as they presented their information. Last year, when we um, 
with the pandemic, we had to sort of rethink how we wanted to share this information and how this presentation would go. So um, with the help of Ms. Nash, we created the Egypt Virtual Fair. So students, the purpose of the Egypt Fair was for students to engage with their audience, practice their public speaking skills and become experts and share their knowledge with others. We wanted to keep the purpose of the Egypt Fair while giving students more choice in how they presented their information. Students researched a topic of interest, wrote an essay, and then presented their project in unique and different ways. Um, so some choices that students have, if you could just click on the choice. So some different choices that students had were creating a wax muse museum on Flipgrid, creating dioramas or posters, using green screen in different and unique ways, creating digital stories using either uh, book creator or uh, storyboard that, or creating songs or rap creations. If any students had any other ideas, I also welcomed their ideas and we're happy to work with them um, to present in different ways as well. Thank you. <laughs> um, the, so all of the projects were hosted on a website and we're going to look at a few unique examples tonight. So if we could click on the Egypt Fair link. Great. Um, if we could go to Mr. Corey's class up top. And then we'll be looking at the Ruchis first. So this student created, her topic was clothing and fashion of ancient Egypt. And she decided to create a fashion show um, to teach everyone about clothing and fashion um, and how it changed. Pause this video, please. Thank you. <laughs> All right, now we're going to be looking at another example of a student who um, did a skit about trait. So, um, if you could please go to Carpenzano Ford. Carpenzano Ford, up top. <clears throat> and if you could scroll down to Marcus. Print 
waves of the melodramatic flight of a bird. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Pharaoh, I don't leave you out. <laughs> you know, my 20 years of being a merchant, never in my life have I been this tired of walking 6,600 kilometers down the Indian desert with this papyrus, jewelry, salt, and crane on my back. <laughs> so, what's life like to be a merchant? <laughs> you know, life's hard to your whole life, you travel and get paid to be a mere vessel of trade. We always have to look out for bandits who can rob anything from us if we don't have armed guards. I can't afford armed guards as I have to be the one to pay for them. At least I'm higher than the scribe in the social ranking. Actually, they're right above me. So I walk up to the end. Central India, and in the corner of my eye, I see them. I see you. <laughs> oh, I have done it. A proud owner of the Guns Happy Tree Shop. Our base currency system is Cadence, which is the equivalent of 90 grams of copper. I trade medicine, jewelry, <laughs> So these are just a couple. <laughs> these are just a few examples of some amazing work that the sixth graders did. And again, these are all will all be shared with you, and you'll have access to um, all these these sites and these different presentations. Um, so if we could just go around. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so uh, one other important piece of this project was student feedback. So students were able to view each other's projects through the different websites and then give each other some different feedback. Um, so if you could just click on the Miss Cotman, yeah, if you could just go down to the next, oh, next one. And if you could just click on the first student there, Harvey. Thanks. So students were able to really give specific and positive feedback to one another based on their presentations to really help them and aid them to know what they did well, or what they might want to work on for next time. Thank you. We can just go back. Um, this year, we were actually able, students were actually able to in person share their projects, which was fabulous. <laughs> uh, we were able to share with the fifth graders. So on the next two slides, there are just some pictures of the fifth graders sharing out with the sixth graders. Some of them dressed up, some of them had animations to show, some of them had posters or dioramas to show or raps to sing, but it was a really fabulous celebration. And we hope to make it bigger next year. Thank you. Good evening. I'll be talking about the technology integration in fifth grade at Greenville. So often we try to give a lot of choice when we are working with either a big unit, for example, in writing, we recently finished a memoir unit and that's pretty personal to a lot of the students. So if they're not comfortable with sharing it and reading it to the class or having us put it up on the bulletin board, we created a final project choice board where they would have the option to either create a piece of artwork, create a flip book, create a newscast, just highlighting some of the special moments of the memoir that they're willing to share with us. Um, we also create choice sometimes in how we do an end of unit assessment rather than the traditional pen and paper, doesn't always work best for everybody. So we have a few choices on here from our Aztec, uh, Inca and Maya ancient civilization unit, where students could create a board game, whether physical or digital, they had the option. Again, they could do Google Slides. Some students created board games just on a Google Slides where it was like a game show and they would ask questions. And um, one of our students actually it's very good at coding. And I can't say that I taught them much about coding, <laughs> but they have used also a platform called Scratch, if you're familiar with it, to create, again, another game to show us what they know after um, a whole unit on ancient civilization. 
We also use different study tools. So again, versus the traditional study guide, we may have a choice board that has different games to play uh, for math. For example, if you look in the bottom left corner, um, it could take you to a different doc. It could take you back to lessons that we've taught throughout the unit. So you could practice and study for your upcoming tests. Might have virtual manipulatives, just different ways for students to also practice while they're at home. And lastly, over here, we do have a win choice board, which in the upper elementary grades, we have a win period, so what I need. And if students are in the classroom and kind of thinking, what should I be working on? We typically have six, nine, or 12 options of different skills that they could practice. And some might be a little bit more artistic and drawing, but it would take you to a website to help guide you through how to draw something. And Jonathan, if you could click on the final project, I'll just show you one a little bit larger. So here's an example, um, and there's hyperlinks within here to give students examples of what we're looking for after they've read through directions. Um, we offered the choice of podcasts, flip books, Animoto. Thank you, you could go back. And as always, we do offer them the option to let us know what they would like to do if it's not on the choice board. And if it you know, seems fitting, then we let them do that. If you go to the next slide. Thank you. So an example of one of the final projects for the memoir piece is called the Panic Haze. If you could click on that. So before we play it, I'll give a little background. This student wrote a memoir about her anxiety about playing the trombone with fifth graders as a fourth grader. So she had a very lengthy memoir piece. She was not very comfortable in getting up and sharing it. So instead she played the trombone, it's her in the background to highlight her skill and gave us a little background on what she took away from that. You could play. Hi, and welcome to the message in November this is a program from an elementary school. We try to find a message for each song we're waiting for. A lot of the time, you might learn a life lesson from the record of We might not notice it until later. That's fine. This podcast will help you learn things from the directions of writing different people. wondering when it's time for a bulletin board, how we would show some of these projects that are digital. Um, so here's just an example, and you would have to, I don't think you could click on it, but hold your phone up to it later if you would like to see it. It will take you to a newscast. So my co-teacher had the brilliant idea of making QR codes for student that did, students that did um, digital projects. This way, everybody's was still up on the board in some way. Um, and lastly, over here, we have an end of unit assessment on Scratch. So this is a platform where students can code and create games based on uh, different questions that somebody might have to answer. So this student came up with her directions. And then as you move forward, you could actually play the game and move spaces as you get questions right. 
You can go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, a new, newer to us app that we've tried this year is Canva. Um, we've used it in a number of different ways. So the first example um, up there that you see are actually directions to a board game that students created using Canva. This one is for a PSA in science for a science project on pollution. And the bottom two are posters that this one, Pepe's Diner was a math project where students had to use math skills to come up with different prices and eventually do um, take turns and go to each other's restaurant and how much would this cost? How much do I owe you? And it was used for math. This is another PSA project done as a poster. So Jonathan, if you could click the top left, thank you. And this is all using Canva. If you are a fifth grade parent, that was a little preview um, of directions that will go to a board game for our math game projects that will be presented on June 10th to parents. Um, and then if you could click the PSA. here, but just an example of Google Classroom, which we use every day, especially since the pandemic. Um, it's a way for us to keep work organized. If students click on the classwork tab, they would find each of the units in order. They would find resources, feedback from their teacher and peers. They could find their grades on here. So it's, and, and you know, they could message us back and forth. We also post a morning message or a morning activity we might start a mini lesson in reading and ask them to create a jam board, which is the biography picture, where they would just tell us what they know by putting a sticky on the jam board. Um, and then similar to what you saw in sixth grade, an example of student feedback where they would give to peers would be to post a Google slide 
with each of their names, they would link their writing piece, if that's what it was for. And we might say, okay, whoever's in the box next to you, then that's who your partner is. And you know, they would give each other constructive feedback and we could also see that as well and monitor. Thank you. In a moment, we'll hear from our uh, Sealy Place colleagues. Um, I just uh, thank you to uh, the administrators and teachers who gave uh, uh, put a lot of time into preparing uh, for tonight's presentation. And I think it's also uh, important to thank uh, Ms. Andrea Nash, who had hoped to be here tonight, but was unable to be, but she is, works very carefully with the teachers um, in all three schools to help them learn about these technology tools and to, um, to implement them. So um, thank you everyone. Um, and now we'll be hearing from our friends from Sealy Place uh, about their one school, one book program. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for providing us the opportunity to share with you tonight about a school-wide program that we recently participated in at Sealy Place. Before we begin, I would like to introduce to you our presenters for this evening. Um, Julia Huang, the assistant principal at Sealy Place, Lynn Fleischer, a second grade teacher at Sealy Place, Raina Shapiro, our school psychologist, one of our one and a half school psychologists, and Olga Jubinville, who is a fourth grade teacher at Sealy Place. The past two years, we have spoken frequently about the importance of social emotional learning in diversity, equity, and inclusion as part of our school experience and our daily instruction. Our work was inspired by the commitment of the Edgemont schools to create a welcoming and affirming environment for all members of the school community. In addition, through our professional development with Stacy Williams and our collaboration during our monthly faculty meetings, we have been focused on providing learning experiences that connect our students' learning to self, others, and the world around them. We are proud to share with you how we brought this all together through our collaborative work with One Book, One School. One lesson through our work with Stacy Williams on implicit bias and inclusive spaces and in instruction was the importance of choosing literature with diverse characters representing our student body and the world we live in. We brought together grade levels to brainstorm ways on how to create developmentally appropriate lessons and activities based on this topic. Our faculty meetings focus on how we can create a welcoming and affirming environment for all members of our school community. We also watch videos on implicit bias and microaggressions that had been, that had been shared by Stacey Williams and we engaged in rich discussions as a faculty. I will now turn it over to Rena. So a committee of faculty and administrators met looking for just the right book that would focus on inclusivity and in community, honors diversity, and promotes respect for individual differences. We chose the book, The Day You Begin, by award-winning author Jacqueline Woodson, because it perfectly captured our focus. The book is lyrical, beautifully illustrated, and engaging. And it was a spark for lessons celebrating what makes individual, what makes each individual in our school community unique. The book begins with the words, the, there are days when you walk into a room and no one there is quite like you. I think we could all relate to that in some way. And then the author goes on to describe experiences of many different children during times when they feel different from their peers. 
did want to share with you just a short clip of what the students were able to see. This is actually the author, Jacqueline Woodson, reading the book herself. Um, so we wanted to create a shared experience for you as well. Where you begin to find the places inside your laughter and your lunches, your books, your travel, and your stories, where every new friend has something a little like you and something else so fabulously not quite like you at all. So that is the day. This is the day you. Each grade was provided with sample questions, discussion prompts, and activities to do before, during, and after reading the book. For example, before, look around. Are we all alike? How are you different? How are you different than those around you? How are you the same? During. At first we learned that Angelina didn't want to tell other children about her summer. Why do you think that was? And after, what happens when you begin to tell your own story? Why did the character's voice get stronger as the story went on? Now we're gonna focus on showing you what each grade level was able to do developmentally with the same project um, using this book and one book in one school. And we hope you enjoy this compilation of work. Thanks, John. So here you see a kindergarten display, a bulletin board of, um, that was generated by the children when they answered the question, what is something that makes you unique? You can't really see the, the words very closely, but you can see they each made a, a little doll and they decorated themselves to represent who they are. They're pretty cute, pretty cute. Here you can see a little bit better, larger scale. Um, because the writing might be a bit hard to read, I'll share a few of the responses. I am unique because I speak two languages. I am American and Indian. My grandparents live in India. And another one says, I am unique because I can add big numbers. <laughs> so cute. This one is another kindergarten display. And one, uh, the first kindergartner wrote, I am unique because I have a unique voice. I'm intrigued. I really want to hear this child, <laughs> whoever it is. I want to hear the sounds. And another wrote, I am unique because I come from Japan. In the first grade, they had a different format altogether. Their goal was, their, their task was to interview a classmate about what makes them unique. So in this first grade class, they discussed the identity groups and unique experiences of the book's characters. Afterwards, they interviewed a classmate about what makes you unique. The students had lots of fun sharing their uniquenesses and learning new things about their buddies. So I am, a, as you know, a second grade teacher and um, we are so happy to share our, our class experiences as well. This is an example of poetry writing in my class as a response to the reading. After we read the book, we shared our thoughts about the character's feelings and experiences. We discussed the book's themes of diversity, identity, and inclusion. And then we discussed our personal similarities and differences within the context of our classroom and our school community. The students made personal connections to the book and identified some characteristics they felt made them unique. They then drafted poems to reflect and celebrate their self-identified uniquenesses. Lastly, they, they did a portrait on the front, and I will say that they took a great deal of time and care because they really wanted you to see them. It was, it was lovely. Um, the next slide, thank you. In the, next, in the next one, these are examples of a storyboard now response, or, uh, yeah, response to the story from another class. After reading the book, the class shared their thoughts about the book's important messages and identified some favorite parts. The students were then asked to choose one of their favorite parts from the book and write about it. 
and how it connected to how their character, their uniqueness connected to the story's message. Using the storyboard that plot, platform online, each student created a visual representation of this favorite part and wrote about the connections that they had made. Okay. Thank you. In third grade, these are some examples of the written responses that they wrote in response to the book. Um, based on one of the major themes of the story, the students were asked to write about how they were fabulously different from their peers and what that means to them. As just an example, one of the students wrote, some people have a dad, unlike I do, but even with my little family, I am very happy. The student then goes on to say, some people don't have eyes as dark as I do, for when they look into my eyes, instead of the common brown shade, they see a dark blackish brown color. I may not look like others, act like others, but one thing is for sure, I am proud that I'm special and unique in my own way. I'm currently teaching fourth grade at Silly Place and I'm excited to share some of the work that we did in fourth grade with this book. Students in fourth grade imagine what their pages would look like if they were part of The Day You Begin. Each student thought about their own experiences of when they felt fabulously different and shared them following a similar sentence structure to the author, Jacqueline Woodson. Within each response, the students were able to share their personal perspectives and experiences, which connected their thinking to the larger idea of inclusion and diversity. That's the central message of the story. One craft move that the illustrator of the book used was incorporating a ruler throughout the pictures as symbolism to measuring yourself up against others. And so some of the students challenged themselves to then, you can see here, they tried to include a ruler into their own pictures. Once everyone finished, what we did was created a class book, um, compiling all of the work that we did and sharing all of our experiences. In our fifth grade classes, our students focused on the question, what is a trait where every new friend has something like you? They interviewed their classmates to identify a similarity and a difference that they shared. And our sixth graders did something a little bit different. We wanted to provide you with an example of how the book was used, not just in the academic setting, but across the school um, in its entirety. As part of the art curriculum, students were asked, how do you see yourself and have the opportunity to create a self-portrait? Thank you. So thank you for this opportunity to share this curriculum highlight at Sealy Place. The day you begin united our school community and we are building upon this common experience. We hope our presentation provided a glimpse of the rich and meaningful learning experiences in our classroom. And we really appreciate the Board of Education support and we look forward to our continued collaboration around these important goal areas. As we leave you tonight, we leave you with a challenge. Consider the sentence that we shared at the beginning. There will be times when you walk into a room and no one there is quite like you. There will be times when you walk into a room and no one there is quite like you. What does that mean to you? And this is a great conversation starter with your own family and your children and those around you. Um, it's a very important message and it gives you a lot to think about. So we thank you for inviting us and allowing us to share this experience with all of you. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. So thank you everyone. That was fantastic. Um, I don't play well in the sandbox. I don't know if, if the board want, has any questions that they'd like to ask sort of broadly about you know, what you saw tonight. Not a question, but I think this concept using one book across all the grades in so many different ways. And it's a simple text, obviously, because you've got young readers. That's a fabulous, just fabulous school-wide project. So I applaud the creativity that went into the projects, you know, making this relevant across seven grades. This is actually something that was done several years ago at EHS as well. 
they did have, I think, two years of one school, one book. They did uh, Persepolis, which is a graphic novel, mm -hmm. and um, The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime. Oh, wow. So, yeah, it, it's, uh, it is very powerful. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, some mostly comments, some questions. Um, I guess first with the Greenville, first the question is really probably more for Paul than anything else, because I'm sure the teachers themselves were concentrating more on just all the fabulous things they can do with the technology. But I remember when you were first coming in, we were talking about the whole SAMR model and what can we do with the technology. I mean, this seems like you're well into modification, maybe even into redefinition on some of this stuff. I mean, it's uh, you're, you're far beyond just the initial substitution and augmentation. And um, one thing that occurred to me, I mean, in the past, I probably would have used the terminology levels the playing field. I guess now we'd use equity more. But when I look at some of the projects that were done, because I know in the past when my kids did them, they didn't have technology, sometimes an individual kid's creativity might have been limited by their ability to physically build, you know, some elaborate pyramid or something. And you saw a lot of projects where it's clearly the parents had done it for the kids and things like that. But with the digital tools, I, I suspect that I say levels the playing field a little more in terms of the things you can do and express your creativity and also just the choice, the ability to right, do things in a lot of ways. I want to do a podcast. I'm going to do a, a video. I want to do things. So I think that's tremendous thing there. Um, on so the Seably stuff, again, a tremendous concept. I assume it really helps build a nice sense of community across the whole the whole school. Um, I'm just curious, it also looks to me almost, I know that wasn't the purpose in this case, but almost like a lesson of differentiation, right? Because you've got, you know, kindergarten through six, all, you know, essentially taking the same task, but approaching it at sort of wherever they happen to be. But it seems that approach could even be used, you know, in a more micro version with, within say a grade kind of thing, because obviously some kids are in different places than others. Absolutely. But this yeah. is tremendous, and, and just my general comment, I mean, this is my sixth year, but these are always the things that I love as a board member more than any other meetings we have, because the vast majority of what we do is at 30,000 feet, and we know it's important, but this is you know where the rubber hits the road. This is where it actually happens. So it's always really wonderful to be able to actually see what's happening in the classroom. So thank you. Anyone else? Thank you all for the just remarkable breadth of presentations and um, allowing us to, to see the diversity of options that teachers and students have in the classroom. Um, and I won't reiterate everything Alex said, but um, I, I, I agree with what, what he did share because um, it's 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 just true. It, it it plays to to where we are, and and allowing us to see it at this level is 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 fabulous at, at both schools. So thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. It's it's all with creativity of the teachers and their students, um, and I think that that's the word that sort of stuck in my head, along with choice, is creativity, and choice, which I think are things that are really, really important in this day and age. And to me, more so than maybe bubbling in a Scantron sheet, um, <laughs> this, these types of assessments and activities uh, really help kids demonstrate deep learning and to exercise those sort of creative muscles. So uh, thanks, I hope you enjoyed it. And thank you again to our teacher presenters and administrative presenters. Uh, please don't hang around for the rest of the boring stuff, excuse me. Um, uh, <laughs> I'm serious. Oh, sorry. Um, but true. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Victoria, we have the bond update now. Jonathan, I, I just sent you an email. I, I meant to send you this ahead of time um, with a file. It should just be a PDF that you can present. Could you pass that down to everyone? Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. So nice coming out of the budget season and after feeling like I had to do so much talking through all of this to sit back and, and see something about curriculum. And I think what a great tie it is to um, what was just approved by or, or voted on by the community is that all of that work with the budget what it really impacts and, and what matters are, are these student outcomes and experiences. Um, so I, I echo the comments that were made by everybody. Thank you for that. Um, tonight, we're not talking um, about budget in any way, but it's a good opportunity to just talk a little bit about our ongoing non-bond related projects and the bond projects and, and the scope of work that's going on. As you can imagine, as we all are living through some of these challenges in our own personal lives, there are a few things that are that are um, presenting some some challenges currently and, and potential challenges as it relates to the timelines and costs associated with any construction work. Um, if we could focus on the side that says non bond construction timelines first. Um, as we know, and, and John McCabe, director of facilities is here as well. John has presented a five year facilities plan. We've talked about throughout the budget development process, the, um, the aspect of, of utilizing our building improvement line to do a lot of work, but also um, fairly consistently using a transfer to capital as part of the budget vote um, each year to set aside money specifically for small projects and, and tasks. There are four um, non-bond construction projects that we're really looking at. The one that is coming up really soon for us is the renovation of the bathrooms here at the junior senior high school. Um, I include this on the line and, and I've indicated the funding source, the timelines, and some notes, because I think in each case, there's something that, that's worth noting for us. Um, what we will be doing is, is starting on June 24th this year uh, and continuing through the summer, we'll be doing renovations of the lower admin faculty bathrooms, the D building bathrooms, the upper and the lower floor, and the C building. And the funding source for that is primarily through the transfer to capital of $750,000 that was approved in the 21-22 budget, the budget that we're currently in. Um, but I've indicated here, plus additional supplemental funding via district-wide improvement lines. Um, we did go out to bid on this and, and the work is, is um, it, it's costly, um, as one can imagine, with escalating prices associated with labor and materials themselves. Uh, we've had to make a decision to scale back and, and not do the arts building bathroom, um, which is the district office bathroom as well. At the same time, I think that decision, um, there's more of a reason than just saying to make sure that, that we can accommodate the work associated with those other bathrooms we spoke of. I think we have um, you know, ever evolving ideas about how to utilize that space, in particular as it relates to the district office, once we have the new renovation and expansion um, on the A building here, um, that will give us an opportunity to really look at the use of those bathrooms, the size of the bathrooms as it relates to that atrium when you walk in as well. Um, and so that part of the, the project is, is going to be put off for a later date. The next summer and what was just voted on was the, sorry, I'm jumping ahead. Um, we had received funding um, and opportunities through some federal grants, both the ARPA and the, the CURSA CRRSA grants uh, to provide us funding for a variety of different COVID uh, responses, one of which is air quality improvement. Um, and in the building that we're in now is called the resource building. Our infrastructure as it relates to the HVAC system is aging, it's antiquated. And if you recall last year, we had to do some uh, repairs to it to, to keep it up and running at the time. We have had plans through the use of that funding to purchase a new HVAC system and to install However, lead time to secure that equipment is really delayed for us. Um, so we're looking at a six month period of time in order to even receive the equipment, which is requiring us to move that project from this summer, 22, to the summer of 23. John, can you just uh, explain why, because I think it's important, if it's six months away, you might say, why don't we just you know, do the work six months from now when we get that in? Why is it prudent for us to wait to summer 23 with that rather than do it mid-year 
um, when we're able to receive the equipment. Well, with the installation of the new air conditioning system, HVAC system on, on this building, there's quite a bit of dunnage work involved, which is like new support, a new support center for the units themselves to make them more accessible for maintenance. Uh, they're, they're much larger units uh, due to economical and technological advances in HVAC systems. So the units that you see out there right now are maybe about 30, uh, maybe 60% of the size of what a new unit is going to be. So there's quite an elaborate scheme of steel that's going to go in the back to support these units. Um, also, you're talking about now going from a two month project to squeeze it into a Christmas break and a spring break, which is uh, kind of a dangerous way to approach that. If you consider uh, having to possibly dismantle those units, put the dunnage in place, and then reconnect those units to service the building again, I don't think our luck is going to be that good to carry on with those as far as servicing the building. So, it's probably in our best interest here to just wait another year. We'll get a very early start on the bidding for the new units. We'll probably pay a little bit of a premium to purchase them and store them uh, pre-construction, possibly uh, putting an order in in like September of this year to procure them and have them on site for June of 2023. So I think it's best. To do. Thank you, John. The third um, item you see here is the Sealy Place window replacement project, which we talked about throughout the budget development um, process. Uh, we are targeting a $700,000 transfer to capital in the 22-23 budget and intend to use additional supplemental funding if necessary from the district-wide improvement line, um, if need be, to, to be able to complete that project. That project is on schedule as we just are really in the development phases of that now. And then the last one here is something that um, we had originally thought was going to be able to be taken care of as part of the bond. Um, is there's an oil tank uh, in the back parking lot where that area we've talked a lot about at Silly Place, um, where we're now leaving as a parking lot, but are going to have that emergency access road in the back. Uh, and the hope was that with some of the, the, it would be included in the ancillary work in the redesign there with cost escalating. Um, and going up quickly, I think we're trying to be prudent and recognize that the bond funding is going to be limited to, to um, and we're not going to have as much flexibility in there, given the cost right now. Um, and so we believe it is going to be prudent for us to consider in the budget development for next year to look at maybe increasing the district wide improvement line so that we can take care of the uh, replacement of this tank separately. And so it's not drawing down from the bond related uh, costs themselves. And so we've kind of teased that out from the two lines, either on the back being bond related or other work that we spoke of before. Take any questions on the non bond related items first, Judy. So, go ahead. So, starting with the first one, uh, or maybe the last one. So, the oil tank replacement, what is the value that you're looking for? And will it be put into the board for the community or will it be just kind of open with as a part of our operating budget? John, do we have a, a quote here, a no, number on that one? Well, we were originally looking to put a fiberglass tank in the ground, but they were a year out to get a, a tank of made of that material. So I think we're looking at a double wall steel tank, which are fairly readily available. 10,000 gallon tank is what we have there. They're, they're, that's kind of a common size. So I, I spoke to a, a gentleman that does service for us. He's also an all tank installer. He's saying probably in the area of three to three fifty for a uh, new installation. That's a very rough estimate. There's a lot of piping to be considered. Our piping goes under the foundation of the building and it travels underground into the boiler room. So it's going to be it's not going to be the easiest installation that I've ever seen done. So it, it'll be probably a little bit of a premium on. What a basic estimate. And do we have to put it for community to work? Yeah, so I think then the second part of the question is, and this is something we'll, we can discuss through the budget process. So whether we'll include that as part of like a transfer to capital for the specific project there, or whether we believe that our, our uh, district wide improvement lines um, can absorb some of that cost. And it seems to me that there are logistic issues which differ the whole HVAC project. So, uh, what kind of risk uh, does it kind of for learnings that it can offer us as we take on the new bond project? Because 
Uh, I'm sure this whole COVID is now a two-year-old phenomenon. So somewhere we got a feel that the everything is getting pushed back. So where did we learn about the HVAC delay happening and, and any learnings that we can take from that? Well, I mean, the whole supply chain issue right now is affecting everything from automobiles, <coughs> air conditioning equipment to refrigerators and televisions. So anything with a computer chip in it, that's already a problem. And all the HVAC equipment, they all have computers in them. They all have automated capability. And we run a building management system. So we integrate our building management system with all of our HVAC equipment. So that's, that's the first hurdle right there, the, the computer chip issue. Then you have uh, things like copper and aluminum, you know, and, and there's labor shortages in the manufacturing of the equipment. So you're looking at six months for what we were looking at to put back there. That's why for the Sealy uh, phase one project, we're going to probably be bidding that in the fall to get a, you know, to have that six month lead time completely compensated for. And, you know, just uh, hope that that, that holds for us. Yeah, I think when, when we flip the page, we'll see a significant shift in the timeline for phase one at Sealy Place. Um, it's due to the same reasons that, that we're seeing now. So, and I, as to understand, because these are chips issue, if we are doing something like a civil construction at Greenville, the civil construction, we are not seeing any big delays, which are kind of material, similar to what we are seeing in anything which is related to electronics and chips. Yeah, that's just one part of the unit. Yeah. But, you know, uh, something that's not even related to chips. So I've seen, I've heard of roofing jobs where they have all the insulation and all the rubber material, it's called EPDM, the rubber material made for roof coating on the job site, but they didn't have the fasteners for the insulation. Oh my God. So it had a, a screw held up the whole job for like weeks. So you just don't know what's gonna pop up to bite you. And you know, it, but it's something that could be on a critical path to constructing something. Could be the uh, metal studs for a partition wall, you know, or the uh, the blocks for a, a foundational wall. So it's it's any kind of. So, so John, what are the learnings that we can take as you, because we are taking up a huge project and you know each of these small things will create a big issue for us. So some learnings that we can institutionalize and create as a opportunity for the you know the, for the next person as they or the construction company as they take over the project. Anything that how you can help us make sure that the future timelines don't get impacted by it. Well, um, we're actually, what we did for the bathroom project is we sat down with the general contractor and we had a contact with all the subs and tr try as best as we could. Now we're dealing with, you know, hoping people are, have integrity and are going to be honest with us. But um, in, in a lot of, you know, a, a large percentage of our assumptions. But, uh, you know, we, we asked the sewer all the subs to get guarantees that it can get tile, plumbing fixtures, you know, the, the uh, sinks and the toilets, the urinals, and just make sure that that stuff was ready to be available. Copper pipe, cast iron pipe, you know, so it, in a bathroom project, there's a pretty good amount of materials that go into it. So he was very confident that he did everything. Uh, his plumbing was confident. The plumbing was a major part of the project. The tile guy was absolutely sure he could get the tile. So that's, that's what we decided to proceed with. With an addition or a new building, I mean, there's just so much that goes into it. You really, you really have to trust fate and, and just hope that uh, all the old materials can be gathered around or something like that. It's, 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 it's quite an endeavor to work on. There's just no way to guarantee from our end that everything will be available. You know, so we just, uh, you gotta depend on hope and a lot of that. And one last question on the on the project that has deferred the bathrooms in the arts and district. What is the delta that we are looking at? So seven hundred fifty thousand dollars we budgeted for the bathrooms, and now we are pushing back some part of the project. So how much of value of that project is getting pushed out? Well, those two bathrooms are relatively small. So if we were just to build them in time the way they are now, we'd probably be looking at one hundred and fifty thousand for those two bathrooms. Um, now, if we want to, if we're, if we're thinking about making it more of a, a communal type of bathroom with more fixtures in it and expanding them, of course, the price is going to go up. Just to add to that, the 750 is not the budget for it. That's what we, that was part of the budget vote in order for the transfer to capital. What we had to bid this work 
and the bid came in at what it came in. It's above 750,000 for that without the network in there. And so we have to subsidize that with some of our building um, district-wide improvement lines as well. I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate that 429 line in the budget. That's been a lifesaver for over a decade here. It's really carried us through a lot of projects. It's gotten a lot of work done here. So I mean, really, as, as much as you can maintain that or even increase it a little bit over time to rise with inflation, you know, it, it really has yeah. provided a great service to the district. Except that now, because it's all going to coincide with a big capital project, so there'll be you know a huge bump up on the tax revenue, which was anticipated by the community. But if you combine that with the regular capex, also, then uh, I'm just very fearful of what it would imply for the tax increase. Uh, didn't quite hear the last part. Wait, wait, the bond, the bond project, the bond money can only be used for the same. No, 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 correct. Yeah, but uh, if you combine the line number 29 at the time when the bond capex is also happening then there'll be a dual effect of the tax increases for the, for the company yeah i think it's that's more of a for the, the typical capital investment like uh, the transfer to capital that the 429 line is good for i don't think in the grand scheme of things it's going to do much to help the bond work but uh we are going to use it for the old thing right so. I, yeah i think no that's the point is just increase increase Two things: increase in debt service, increase in is that what you're saying, right? In in our um, like a district wide improvement line, both of those have a, a adverse effect on the tax rate and just some concerns. It's creating the bump in a, in, a, in a year when you don't want right. that. And I think as as we know, it's about balance. So we would have to look at where else might we be able to um, reduce in, in order to to make those adjustments and still have it be palatable. Um, and I think that that's one of the toughest things for us in, in um, every aspect that we look at is making the determination about what's going to have the greatest impact and, and what's our greatest need. Um, and I, I do think, you know, looking at all the 1620 codes, all of all of the facilities codes, um, they're they're highly volatile right now. We've seen that with um, some of the transfers that we've asked as it relates to electricity and water and um, you know any of the utilities. They've just been they spiked on us over the last few months. Um, and so I think that there's there, there's greater risk as it relates to a lot of these codes over the next year or two years, um, just given that we don't know what, what the landscape is going to look like. And I echo your, your same concerns, Milash, and, and I think um, you know, there's going to be a lot of review and management to take a look at this over time. Thank you. Um, I guess my question is, um, what do we currently have on the oil tank and is there and what's i assume it's just the boiler but is there a kind of long-term vision to transition away from oil as a source well of, the transition the first transition that would make the most sense would be to natural gas you have natural gas service in the building so an energy performance project perhaps down the road for the district to upgrade the high school plan I don't know that you'll get gas at the high school level. It'd be quite a, quite a run to get natural gas in there, but it can be done. But at Seal, you have it right at the door. I just don't know if the capacity on the piping is adequate to run a boiler as well. But then you would go dual fuel like we have in Greenville. So, you know, the ability to not run out of oil and run out of gas. It's, it's nice to have the dual fuel capability, it really is. Um, BTUs and horsepower, right? There's really, there's, there's no substitute form at this time. Mm -hmm. We're not going to be able to run any other kind of alternate energy to heat our buildings. I mean, it, during the down seasons, like between the, the spring and the summer and the summer and the fall, there are ways to cool and heat with outside air and temper it in different ways. But when we get into the extremes of the summers and the winters here, it's about power. Unfortunately, fossil fuels is the only way really to propel that power. So, uh, do we necessarily need oil? Can we convert to natural gas? Uh, we probably could, but I don't think we'd be able to do that on a snap. Mm -hmm. I think we really need to work that oil part in and then try to migrate over to gas in the interim. Okay. Between now and someday in the future, near future. Too. John, how long would it take to? migrate 
from oil to natural gas, or at least to have both options? Well, uh, what would be the, to the time line on that? Uh, I think if we have an opportunity here for energy forest contract, we're just buying them all. Right, which would be a tremendous savings. We saved a tremendous amount by going from what's called a T12 bulb to a T8 bulb. Back in 2009, when we did the lighting upgrade with the other upgrades, the, um, uh, what's, what's the name of the track? That's not LED. 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 The technology wasn't very good and it was almost blinding to be in a room with LED lighting. It has improved remarkably since then. and. It's a good opportunity now to go district wide LED. And you know, the savings that you would get in electricity would help your investments towards like uh, upgrading the heating plant. <coughs> and then you're putting efficient boilers in ceiling, which will be very economical as far as fuel consumption is. What we have now is not very economical in that sense. They're very durable and they're easy, they're, they're fairly easy to maintain, and you know, they're inexpensive maintenance wise. But um, if you add some more of the features that are coming with the new technology and burning, and burning equipment for heat, um, you would uh, also save money in the fuel end there. So there is an opportunity here for an energy performance contract that would finance itself. And with that, you get the gas service to the boiler and to the city. I'm just trying to get a sense of what kind of timeline we would need to you be. Can, is that two you get an energy performance company to come in here and do a survey, and you know they can come up with a proposal. That's how we did it back in 2009. I mean, you, you're going to incur debt from it, right? You have to pay down the loan. Mm -hmm. But if you were really focused on channeling that money towards paying off the loan, you can almost have zero, yeah, zero something. Mm -hmm. Here we kind of took that money and we're kind of using it for projects. I mean, that's kind of where that, that 400 line, that 4.9 line came from and everything like that. So we've been, we've been kind of rolling that into improvements going forward. But you're kind of in a position now where these improvements with the bond and the HVAC that we're doing over the next couple of years, and we've got a lot of bathrooms done over the last couple of years, you can really focus on just turning the cash flow from the savings and paying off the debt for the energy performance contract. You can do that immediately, right? Sorry, any other questions down here? All right, Monica. All right, Brian, thank you very much. Let's we go got to the, the other, other side. side. More yeah. to do. No, no, no. So, no, I'm, yeah. Yeah. no I haven't done. So, on the other side of the document, it's the bond related construction timelines. And, and again, some unfortunate news, I think, in terms of uh, where we're at, but it, it's the same story. Um, lead time, supply chain issues as it relates to securing materials and, and um, uh, supplies for a project. Um, add into that the delays that we're having with SED approval. Um, and it's, it's a complicated uh, process that has um, evolved, I guess, maybe for the, the nice way to put it, John, that really has not been um, in our vision in the past with some of these SED approvals. We have for some of these projects that would be ready to go, typically, we have architectural review done and, and approval. What's holding a lot of this up right now is there is an individual um, project manager. It's hard, do you know her title, John, specifically? She's a financial, she's something with financial planning. Who is looking at the building aid units as, uh, as it relates to uh, the projects and assigning building units and looking at the buildings a little differently than past reviewers have done um, and requiring additional steps along the way for us to get there. That has slowed this process down. We've done an instructional space review at each school internally that gets signed off on uh, both by the BOCES superintendent, the special education director in the state, and then goes up to SED as well. Um, we've done a review of our special education spaces and, and identified what the um, current usage of spaces and then what the proposed use will be after uh, the bond projects are completed. So it's just been a, um, a number of additional things that have been requested that were not asked for in the past and, and we have not had turnaround um, on any of that work. Um, we spoke today again this morning just to see is there anything else that we can do to move that forward. Right now we believe we have everything there. We, we just aren't, aren't getting the response in the uh, time frame that we would like to, to be able to move forward. 
However, with that said, it's not SED approval alone um, that is slowing us down. If we had approval, um, we still have challenges as it relates to procuring the equipment necessary to make um, the next steps in the process. So like the HVAC project that was set to uh, begin here at the resource building, the phase one Sealy Place um, HVAC project, the Greenville Elementary School and the Sealy Place Elementary School cafeteria renovations that we were hoping to begin and take care of this summer um, in an effort to just spread the work out, not because it had to be done. In fact, we had said the cafeterias were not going to be usable for um, you know, as like a survey next year, because it really hinges on the high school cafeteria renovation. And the, the HVAC project was not going to be complete. It was going to be the initial um, stages of that. So we weren't going to reap the benefits of that. The benefit was going to be just spacing out the work. Um, unfortunately, we're going to have to move that forward to next um, school year. And I think, Nilesh, to your question of like, what are some of the learnings? I think these go hand in hand. Um, you'll see in each of the yellow lines here, I'm just trying to summarize the changes that we've seen from what we presented back in February. We're, we're representing larger or longer um, SED approval timelines than we thought of in the previous estimations. Um, the bidding and the contracting we've extended as well, knowing that that's going to be delayed by some of these same issues. Um, and I didn't go as granular as the report that John D'Angelo gave us last time. I tried to consolidate it into those four lines, but the um, purchasing of and procuring of the equipment is intended to be done so further ahead of time to get us to a point where when we get to construction, we hopefully we have everything in place. And in order to accomplish that, as it relates to all of those, those three smaller projects in phase one, we need to move this out um, a whole year. And so we'll be going out to bid, um, hopefully with approval in August, as opposed to right now, this current time period we thought we'd be at. Um, but that gives us a much larger window of time between when bid and contracts are going out and when construction would actually start to give us some of that flexibility. Yeah. The phase two projects is, is really everything else. And so really this is all kind of now um, evolving into a single phase style project, but you'll see in, in yellow in each of the columns, um, you know, in some cases we're not talking about a proposed change to the total timeline. In fact, full completion, if you look at the, fourth row, Edgemont Junior Senior High School E-Building Addition, Parking Roadway Upgrades. That 9-1-25 date is the same 9-1-25 date that we had at the beginning of quote unquote full project completion. The uh, September of 25 is the, uh, the renovation of the existing A-Building after the new A-Building was built. And you'll see in, on the high school cafeteria renovation, the last row, and um, the second and the third row, Greenville and Sealy Place work, um, we're looking at 24 as the completion um, timeline, which is the same or just two months out from what we had presented back in February. Now, I, I put the big asterisks on here and, and caveat, these are milestone timelines. These are uh, current uh, projections and these hinge upon SED approval um, supply chain and, and a number of other things, including financing, um, which I think is worth pulling into the mix here a little bit as well. Um, what we know, and, and we spoke about in February, is that uh, we have a couple of options in terms of how we want to progress moving forward with the financing. We secured a $3.8 million bond anticipation note last fall that was based on um, a project plan for 12 months. Um, we can, as we've spoken about, we can basically roll that over for a, a second year. We can increase the size of the bond anticipation note to meet our needs for the next 12 to 16 months in that window. We can make a decision to go out to bond early. Um, these are all things that are getting, I think, a little more and more complicated and less linear with increased interest rates, um, with production delays and, and challenges to try to identify what the, the best timing is gonna be for this. So I think a significant project this summer will be to work with our financial advisors who will have um, you know, better advice than, than I could provide independently on this. Um, and, and I would anticipate that we'll have a presentation at some point during the summer to start to talk about what those next steps might look like um, and cost out some options based on, again, current, um, but not necessarily knowing exactly what the future will look like for each of those.
I think the last uh, concern I would just bring out here, and I wish that it was more positive news, but I think it's all mirroring kind of the whole um, experience that we feel are probably in our own lives as well with this um, is just total cost, right? Is, you know, we, when we set a number in the bond, that is for the work that is, we, we outlined the scope of the work, right? And we're not, we can't use bond money outside of that. Um, and the hope is that we've built in the appropriate contingencies to help us be able to deal with the fluctuations. However, I don't think that at the time we could have anticipated 10 or 15% increases in construction costs or an 8% uh, CPI. So we, we don't know fully um, at this point, and it's really just too far up to make a real assessment of that to say, you know, is that money going to cover us for everything that we need? In there? We can secure or use alternate funding to do so, um, which could be utilizing uh, transfers to capital from individual um, yearly budgets that we choose. It could be the use of some of the funding like our building wide improvement lines that we've had in the past. Um, it could be us making a decision to go out for a second um, bond proposal to try to secure additional funding for that. We're way too far out to talk about any of those. We're, we're just not in that. Um, we don't have enough information yet to be able to, to really narrow down what we want. The hope is that we can stay on budget, accomplish the work, and not have to make decisions to cut back or scale back from what we are uh, proposing. Um, but I think it would be um, silly not to mention it, just given that the, the increase in labor and costs and materials uh, that we've experienced over the last six months. Right. Basically, Brian, is all this dependent on what happens within the broad range of the economy and yeah. until we're actually there, we're just not going to know? Yeah, I would agree. I, I think to John's point, we we can have best laid plans and um, we can't guarantee that the copper piping that's necessary to complete one of the buildings is available and it, it may create a delay. Uh, we don't know what the cost is gonna be associated with that right now. Um, it's all gonna come down to the bids and the contracts that we go out with and, and we're a little further away from that right now than to speak really specifically about it. No, I was just going to say, any, anybody else have any questions? So my question is that, uh, so the community approved for a 53 some million dollar mm -hmm. bond. We cannot exceed 53. If required, we'll have to scale down on the capex, so just for clarification. That funding is secured. Yeah. If we if we needed to spend more than that, we'd have to secure alternate funding to do so. We cannot exceed. We can't ask, we can't go out to bond for a larger total than that. So. Sure, can scale back the work to stay within budget. It can secure alternate funding to be able to support work. So, so the community the voted for the bond money. They did not vote exactly what total capital project will finally happen. They they voted on the dollar value and the parameters upon which that dollar, that money could be spent. And as an extension of that, uh, the tax implication because of the changes in the interest rate could be variable because that is not something which is constant correct right so you know when we when um we tried to scope out what what the possible implications could be tax rate we used some um variances on what the current rates were at the time to make an estimation for what the increase could be obviously we've seen um you know the federal the rate increase already and we don't know what it will look like when we're ready to do so to actually go out but that's highly variable based on what rate we get at that time. And given the uncertainty on the logistics and delivery and the construction, can we do two branches of bond or we'll have to do only one branch? I'm not sure what you mean by that. So for, do we have to do a single issuance of $53 million or we can decide to break that bond into based on how the timelines finally shape up? Um, well, using our, our ban right now is kind of doing what you're it's explaining. Exactly. We, we could come this fall choose, you know, if, if we'd have to have justification, right? If our expenses over the next 12 months were going to be $8 million, we could add $4.2 million to that ban. We would now have an $8 million ban during that time. And then um, at the 24 month mark, we would have to make the decision to roll that into the bond at that point in time or make some making payments on it. So there is some flexibility on timing to make sure that. It's not 
like a huge you know, sudden burden without actually you no know, commensurate capex. Correct. And one last question: You keep on saying SED. I just even I, I missed what does SED stand? Sure, it's, it's the State Department of it's uh, facilities review at, at the State Department of Education. Okay. So and they're the ones who do all of the approvals for um, any of our projects, small projects, big projects, um, and it, it's it's the oversight at the state level. They make the determination on um, whether the architectural and engineering um, submittals are appropriate. But they also are making the determination regarding um, building aid units, which then is converted into state aid, how much of that project is aidable, um, and all of that oversight. And just looking at the timeline, unless SED approval comes, we cannot even move an inch because that's a precondition for making even a bidder. Yeah, John, correct me if I'm wrong. We're not going to bid unless we have approval, correct? We're not capable. Yeah, we're not capable. Not so we are actually held to ransom by and that can determine the whole face of it. And interestingly, I know John D'Angelo, when he was here last time, spoke about you, you can get a sense of what the typical timeline is for approval at the state. But what we know is, in, in like many instances, they're understaffed. Um, and in some instances, not working in person, they're working from home. Um, and it's, I think, all confluence of a lot of events that are, are slowing that up for us right now. Um, Victoria and I spoke a little bit earlier today to see what other strategies can we use to um, just try to ensure that we're getting as much attention as we need on that, um, whether that be through working through our local BOCES, who's our representative, um, working through her contacts as opposed to just any way that we can to try to ensure that we're getting uh, the attention and, and the uh, expeditious review that we, we would like. A spring trip for board members? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I just have two quick questions. Um, I just the assumption that all designs are currently in the hands of the State Department of Educa Education for review. Um, all, John? Not yet, right? No, the um, the cafeteria projects are up at SED and mm -hmm. the past architectural and engineering review. Now we have this third wheel up there that's just appeared out of nowhere. Our friend Sigrid, uh, <laughs> she hasn't approved it yet. And I think, Mary to your point, the timeline for actual construction for, like, example, the um, uh, new A building here, it we're not at a point where they need to be there yet, given the timeline that um, we'd be looking to, to actually spend on that project. However, we want it there as soon as we can. Those projects, um, you know, John D'Angelo and his firm, they worked on those smaller, simpler things, cafeteria quick things because we knew we, the hope was to try to do them this summer while at the same time that the larger scale work uh, was being developed that required much more architectural uh, analysis. Okay, so just, I mean, just to be clear, because if, if what we're saying, these look like they're supposed to be in SED approval starting in early June. Is that our mm -hmm. expectation that all those designs will be into SED by early June? Yeah, I believe the uh, eight building addition, for example, June, you know, the first week or so in June, they, they, they anticipate having all the plants set up as CD. Um, these were these were generated and reviewed by Fuller and D'Angelo okay. just last week. Okay, so those great. are their updates based on their expectations. Okay, great. They're doing some touch up work now with like the labs and trying to get some final details ironed out. And um, when it's when, they, when they're presentable to set up as CD, they look at CD. And uh, they're anticipating the first week of June. June 10th is their target date. Great. And then the second question is we are able to go to bond the minute we have SED approval on everything? We can go to bond. Uh, that's a good question. So you're saying if we have something that's lingering that was not, does that restrict us from going to the full on? I'd, I'd, have, to, I'd have to inquire. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think you do need a building permit. That's the right answer. Building permit. That's SED. Sorry, so the, so SED provides the building permit. We don't have to do, we don't have to do anything local. But there are local. But there, okay. there are local zoning. There are local building. Okay, so as soon as they give yeah, us we're a, not subject to local building. Right, right, right. So as soon as they give us building permit on everything. Well, I think if half of it is up there, we would building permit for half of it. You can finance half. Okay. So like we're, we're currently financing through the ban, 
some of that work. Right, right. I mean, but, the, the, but issuing the bond is the part that's going to lock in the interest rate, yeah. and that's yeah. kind of the question mark, right? Mm -hmm. Which is, it sounds like we couldn't, we couldn't, we wouldn't do a, we wouldn't issue part of the bond. We would issue, we would either do another ban or issue the full bond. Those are the two things we would potentially do over the course of the next 12 months. That's what's been recommended to us so far. Yeah, yeah. And I think that that's the work this summer that we need to do some additional work with our financial advisors. On. Okay, great. So, so yeah, if, if it is that we cannot do, we cannot go out for the full bond until everything has a building permit. And that's a totally different set of conversations than if we could do it, if we have a building permit for at least some section of it. But, and, and that's, that's yeah. what I want to get back to. Great. Sounds good. And, and just, I noticed uh, that for everything we are starting in April or May, so if there is a pushback by three months, can we start in July, August, or everything has to start in only in April and May because there's a lot of digging work or a lot of starting work. Uh, what I mean to, I just want to understand is for any reason, if there is a three month delay, then does that push the whole thing by a year or it just will push the whole thing by three months? John, let's take it. I think it depends on what it is, right? We're looking at an example where even being pushed back a few months with the HVAC unit, makes sense for us to move it to a time when the campus doesn't have students involved. And so those windows of time of, of like the pre-construction and actual construction work of trying to get it as close to the summer months is, is the general goal. Yeah, when you're, the, the complexity of the project will kind of drive that, right? If, it's a, if you're building a building, the HVAC units really aren't going to show up until towards the end. So you got a lot of structural work to do. There's a lot of site work excavation concrete work, steel, you build with the bones on the building, then you skin in the building, and then you're going to put your finishes in and you're starting to have it. So a six-month delay on the HVAC systems for a new building is not as you know problematic as when you're having an HVAC project like ceiling. That's all HVAC work. So you know that equipment needs to be on site like in the first week because you're going to start setting units on the roof to replace mm -hmm. existing because you need to have the ventilation for school to stay open. So, you know, it's problematic for ceiling, it's not problematic for an addition or you know, you can work around the lays and HVAC, but, you know, the lays or what else? And just building on Marikita's question, so uh, the bond issuance, is it uh, given that the moment you issue the bond, the interest, uh, you know, you start paying the interest from the, the next year onward. So given that the, the most of the CAPEX actual spend happens at the construction start of the phase. So even though the SED approvals come, you actually want to, given that, you know, already the interest rates have rallied pretty hard, you want to actually push it closer to the construction phase rather than post yeah. we We have a lot of flexibility in when we want that financing to come in. And even after issuance, um, we have, and I think I spoke about this at a previous meeting, we have uh, some flexibility in terms of when we want to make our payment as well. So we, we could um, go to issuance in the fall and, and structure it so that our first payment is due six months from then so that we have only one um, payment in that fiscal year and then two in each one moving forward after that. There's some, we have flexibility in mean, how we structure it. But to your point, as you know, the whatever that time period is that we take it for, and from issuance to full payment, the interest is going to be calculated and, and embedded with the whole project in that time. Yeah, I think I just wanted to clarify, I think what Nilesh was also asking, and I think I know the answer, but as you said, right, the HVAC project is HVAC. So if the equipment's delayed, there's nothing you can really what you can do about that. But some of the other projects, where you're not trying to squeeze them in in the summer. So if it right now says, for example, it's going from April of 23 to January of 24. If something else delays that by two months, that probably, the most part, just pushes everything back two months because you're not trying to squeeze it in the summer. It was already going through the school year. So uh, delay at the beginning just sort of pushes it back, but doesn't force you to skip a year. Yeah, I mean, if you could visualize a critical path, right? Yep. What, what you need to get from point A to point B to point C. If point C is delayed six months, you can live with that probably for a while. But if, if point A is delayed six months, well, you know, you can't start anything. Like, you know, say uh, 
the guy who couldn't get the excavator machine right. to take the footings to the foundation, you know, then you're, you're going to be delayed in that regard. So it, it really how the critical path lays out and typically round up for a uh, new building. But like you say, if it's an HVAC project and you can't get HVAC equipment, you can't. But it's also the difference between whether you're like, for example, your HVAC, you want to do over the summer because you can't take HVC out of the building while you're working on it. You, you need it throughout the school year. Whereas, right, the new A building, it's off to the side. So you start it when you start it and we finish and you need it ready for the beginning of a school year, probably to make use of it. But Right. So a six month delay in, in March, really, you're, you're starting to get into September now when you have to open the building. Right, man. So, you know, and then, you know, another, another month to install it, perhaps. So, yeah, six months delay for HVAC system that you're focused on that in, in and of itself is just too long of a period to really mm -hmm. absorb. In, in the current instruction schedule that we have, it has to be out there. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Okay. Policies. The policies. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Up. So uh, that's Jennifer and Doya. Do you want to take? Um. Yeah. I, I can do them. Um. Just uh, unless you want to. Do it. Oh, okay. Um. We have two actually fairly um small uh, additions to two of our policies. So uh, for our code of conduct, we um, were advised that we needed to add an appeals process for short-term suspensions, uh, suspensions of uh, five days or fewer. We already have one in there for longer suspensions. Uh, so we are simply adding uh, that process for the, for the shorter suspensions. Um, and then on the uh, independent educational evaluations, when you're talking about um, the uh, kids who are being evaluated for IEPs or other, other services, um, sometimes parents seek to go out and get independent evaluations, and then they ask us to pay for them. And the previous policy had a set dollar figure for how much we reimbursed. That hadn't been updated in a while. Uh, what we have chosen to do is benchmark it to what we would pay BOCES to do those evaluations rather than set a hard dollar figure. And then the idea is that each year at our reorg meeting, we can approve the BOCES number. So it allows us to vary the rate without having to go in and change the policy every year. And that's pretty much it in a nutshell or them in a nutshell. Sorry, what we were, we were discussing the, the timing. Um, so I guess I should take a motion and I'll ask a question. Oh. Um, do I have a motion on, on these two policies? Do we have to oh, in first reading? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, oh, that's right, it is first reading. So, Here's my question on, on the code of conduct at each stage of the decisions being issued, it says how many days the individual or group has to issue a decision. All right, it's five days, it's 10 days, I think it's mostly 10 days. However, it says, um, if the parents aren't satisfied with the superintendent's decision, they must file a written appeal to the Board of Ed with the district clerk within 10 business days of the date of the superintendent's decision. Um, unless they can show, sorry, blah, 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 blah. Only final decisions of the board may be appealed to the Commissioner of Education within 30 days of the, the decision, but it doesn't say how many days the board has to issue its decision. And it may be that it is an unset term, but it just stood out. I didn't understand. I, I tried to get an answer, but 
Uh, and I looked for an answer and I couldn't find an answer. And I actually went in, if you look in our, um, our procedures for appealing a long-term suspension, it's, it's the same thing. There is no time frame. So okay. um, I don't know, Victoria, if, if there's another source we can go to for, you know, yeah, um, but I wasn't able to find any time frame. In fact, the way the uh, laws are written, um, it sounds like a lot of this procedure is, the time frame is not set forth. Like the, the timing is what we say the timing should be. Okay. So I, I just, I really just wanted to. Nope, that's that's fine. Cause there is, you're that. right. There's there's a set time for everything else, but that's. Uh, okay, fine, sure. that, that's it. Right. Yeah. So I have a question that if this is for a five day suspension and the submitter gets a 10 day to get back. So if it's a five day suspension, shouldn't that number of days to get back should be five days? So the suspension is already going to happen. Hmm. The suspension will be over. Okay. So it will be more, more about uh, being explained for the record. But the suspension has to happen. As you know, sometimes the suspension happens the next morning. Yeah. So if the superintendent gets back at a much later date, uh, then the whole appeal by the parent goes for it's not productive for from the parent side. No, it has to do oh the, the student's oh, record. Okay. Thank you. Thank thank you, Jennifer and Doya, for your for your work on this. I'm, on behalf of the entire board, I am truly grateful. Um, okay, so. Um, before we move to the consent agenda, I think there were a couple of things that we wanted to have some. Yeah, I think due to the questions that I think okay. were brought were for I-8, I-9, and I-10. All right, so do you want to do everything but, but those, Victoria? Sure. I'd like to ask yeah. the board approval of the consent agenda for G personnel, one through nine, H students, number one, I business. Okay, do I have a motion? Uh, Jennifer, second, Doya, all in favor, and that is unanimous. Um, okay, so on I eight. Um, Uh, resolve that for the recommendation of the superintendent of schools, the Board of Education approves the consulting agreement for brown bag image incorporated for live stream services for 2022 and 2023 high school graduation ceremony at a cost of $7,740 for the Is there a motion? What, what, what? No, we pulled them out. Oh, we pulled them out. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, is there a motion? Alex, second, Jennifer. Okay, so the, the question uh, has to do with the fact that last year, this is, this is for the live streaming of the graduation. Um, as of last week, last year's graduation had 80 views. However, I've since been informed that if the video the live stream is somehow downloaded that doesn't get reflected in that number of 80 it just it seemed like it might be something worth double checking whether we really want to do it if all we truly have are 80 views um and maybe and maybe that's not the case maybe 80 views in a class of 150 is sufficient um but i i wanted to at least raise that. Well, could we at least ask them to give us tracking of that for the coming year? So how many views and how many downloads just so that we have good data for we can use to the following year. Sure. And and I said I'm not sure that I don't know if the downloads count or not against so I think um, the raising of the question was the first mm -hmm. that both I or, or Kyle knew of, of how many views occurred last year. Um, and I, I had reached out to him um you know given I knew that there was a question about it and I'll, I'll try to summarize what he said. I think he indicated that we're not sure, obviously, what the positivity rate as it relates to COVID will be in June. Obviously, we've had some challenges the last two years in terms of making decisions. What will graduation look like? How are we going to do this? And how will we support those families who aren't able to attend? Um, and I, I think the the thinking around this and us securing the money for this and, and trying to uh, be able to provide this as an option um, is trying to ensure the family members who need to quarantine or, or who just aren't able to 
um, because either they're immunocompromised or concerned about their health uh, being here, shouldn't be a mitigating factor in their ability to see their, their children graduate. However, I do respect the idea that if it's, if it's not being utilized um, for the cost, then we have to question. Look, given, given the situation where we find ourselves right now at the end of May, and the fact that we never, right now, we don't know whether it's gonna be outdoors or indoors. Sure, um, it seems to me we go ahead with it this year, that's my view, but as Marikita noted, perhaps try and get better tracking so that it can be a, 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 a more data can be used in making the decision moving forward. And, and that would be my recommendation as well, as I think um, you know, two years of data, will help us make a decision if it's sustainable for us to fund this in this way. Um, and if it's something that, that the community is utilizing, I, I do believe that we, um, you know, we have secured the money for it. And, and, and um, I believe that we can make it work in the budget this year. Thanks. All in favor. Okay. It is unanimous. Aye, aye. Yeah. To sign the financial advisory services agreement with capital markets advisors LLC. So, the order for the motion. Yeah, motion, Manikita, second, Monica, thank you. So, Brian, I just had a question there because uh, it talks about the compensation for the new bond issue. So, I just want to understand does it include the total cost that we will incur for issuing the new bond if we were to issue next year? Right. Or will we have any other? expenditure beyond this yeah it's a great question so i think the there are two um capital markets is, is our is our financial advisor that, that we partner with uh, we also have bond council so like our the actual legal work associated with the issuance of and, and ensuring that we have all paperwork in this middle done in a proper uh, and appropriate way both of them have fee structures that are similar to what you're seeing here for capital markets so Regardless of what we do, whether we uh, issue a new bond anticipation note, whether we go out to bond, there will be a, a flat fee that they'll charge for the service, and then you pay a percentage of the overall issuance itself. So um, what we know from, from what you'll see here is, is for capital markets, um, uh, I'm forgetting what it was, 60 cents per every $1,000 on top of the $8,400 kind of flat fee service price. Our, um, the most recent structure that we've had with um, Hawkins, Delfield and Wood, which is our bond council, is similar. It's a $9,750 flat fee plus an additional 75 cents per every, uh, every $1,000 that's financed. So one way to look at it is if we were to go out um, for the whole thing, it's called $55 million, it's approximately a dollar and 45 cents for every thousand which works out to about $80,000 is, is the cost of, of all of that. Um, I, I don't believe that we'll be in a position where we're gonna go full out to bond in this year, but right now in the uh, the budget, you'll see a line called fiscal agent fees, it's 138400 that we have $42,000 budgeted there to absorb the cost of any issuance of the, bit, the bond anticipation notes in there. And if, if we had made the decision to go out uh, for something larger than that, we would have to look at some transfers into that line from, from other legal lines or other um, uh, consulting lines that we have available for us. And one last question, then. what is the general band that you see in the market or the low, what are the prevalent rates? I, I haven't, we haven't spoke directly to capital markets in a little while, um, but I think that that should be, like I said, a big summer project for us. Once we get through the closing out of the year, start to get to the audit preparations. I think that we'll partner with them and I think invite friends of finance and, and some other groups to work with them. Thank you. All in favor? Unanimous and I-10. Other recommendations the Okay. Yeah, okay, is there a motion? Marikita, second Alec, um, question? Yeah, so I just had a question about that. I looked at that font, um, both just trying to figure out how that plays relative to our 
uh, to what we actually budgeted. It looked like it was a little light relative to what we budgeted, or sorry, a little heavier than what we budgeted. So just like checking if you want kind of where that came out on um, yeah. the budget. It's so appreciative of the question. Um, almost an impossible task to be able to, to go through the budget and identify where each of these items um, reside. Um, I actually started to try to come up with the, the number. That I, I, I can't get there either. <laughs> yeah. Because I, I, I don't know that I can tease it all out in that way. Um, I think 30,000 foot view. What this is, is the document that's being approved there. There are two documents on there. One is to um, begin the initiation of, of the services as it relates to the technology through the Lyric, the Lower Hudson Regional Information Center. Um, and the other one being the non-technology related aspects of BOCES. That's on what's called an AS7 form. That is really for them more than it is for us. It is for them, like we're budgeting, to figure out what's our staffing needs. Um, they need to make a, a plan for July 1st for, for many of their summer programs and into September. Um, and so they're using that as a baseline to help generate what they need to do on their campuses in order to support us. If you were to do a crosswalk each year of what we approve here, that we're not approving the expenditure plan necessarily. Our budget has approved that expenditure plan. And we were to match that up to what our actual expenditure, you're gonna see tremendous variances because we might've made a decision after that to, um, um, I'll use Shelly Klein as an example, to use some of our consulting services under a BOCES contract. And then that's gonna see our BOCES numbers jump up. Um, we could have a student come into the district who requires placement in a BOCES program, a special education placement that changes that. So this is, it's truly a snapshot more for their purposes than it is for ours. Um, and if you're, if we're actually looking at the total number there, we know in our budget, we have some contingencies for special education placements in there that are on those both season lines that would actually suggest that we've budgeted more than what that number is there, um, because we knew we needed that in case we have new student placements come into the district. So we're going out for all those services you were requesting to go out once we received, and then including some increase in terms of uh, usage for the Technical program. That's correct. Um, but generally, we on, on target to what we expected. And correct. And I would say, I think um, I had a little more information this year available to me from BOCES than I did last year. I don't know if it's because it's a week later and just that amount of time. Some things we just still don't have prices from them on. Right. They, they're not able to provide that. And so, in some past years, we might have filled up the AS7 without even uh, having an entry because there was no dollar value we could put there. And so, those variances are also. Um, you know, hard to reconcile here, but it, it's an it's a planning document for them that they would like before the end of May. Right. So I think you just you said the operative words. So it's a planning document as opposed to a commitment to spend that with them. Right. Yeah, we get billed for our our, our our actual uses and expenditures through both season. As we know, we we get aid on a lot of that work, and so um, in a lot of cases, it, it is uh, prudent and beneficial for us to have. If we have five million dollars to spend to allocate more of it to BOCES and to non-BOCES related projects. Okay. Any other questions? All in favor? Unanimous. All right. Um, we schedule the meetings for the remainder of the year are June 7th and June 21st. Um, and it will be uh, at essentially at eight o'clock here. Um, and with that, we are up, sorry, no, 